So welcome people of YouTube. Today I'm going to sound like a broken record but this guy is again one of my favorite guitar players. Uh, when I first saw him, he was uh, playing in a band called Pentagram, which he still is a part of. And uh, they eventually, not long after that, became like the biggest band in the country. So, um, you know, my, my friend Randolph Korea today, who we've got with us, he's seen a few things, he's done a few things. So we're going to get into all of them. Randolph, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Warren. It's a pleasure being here. Okay, good evening, so, afternoon, good morning. <laughs> it's it's evening, yeah, it's around 10 in the night. <laughs> yeah, it's afternoon for you, right? Yep. Yep. Chai time. Awesome. So, um, we're going to get straight into it. Um, when you started playing guitar, what was your favorite band at the time? Um, I think it have to be a tie between Bon Jovi and Whitesnake. <laughs> <laughs> it was probably late like, 80s, right? It was, it was like I started I started playing a bit late, like when I was 13 or 14. Okay. So, I was kind of listening to a lot of uh, that kind of rock. Cool. I mean, um, there's, there's still plenty of like organic blues-based stuff in both that, you know, especially Whitesnake. But... Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, and it's not... I, I wouldn't say like, you know, it's... Look down upon that kind of music at all, no, man. Like I, I went for the Bon Jovi gig as well. I was fifteen. <laughs> oh, man, that's wicked. <laughs> that was the Rumble Sports Complex, yeah. Yeah, I remember that's... that. Mid nineties. I just finished my uh, ten standard exams, and it was right after that. Um, okay, so uh, Bon Jovi and White Snake, and then um, is that what you started uh, learning, or did you have to like you know start off with something simpler, or how did that go? No, I was, I think, uh, this one album that shattered my dreams was uh, Kill Em All by Metallica. I think after I heard that album, I never heard Bon Jovi and Whitesnake <laughs> and all of that again. Yeah. It, it kind of came more of, I mean, it was that teenage angst mixed with, I think I used to play a lot of soccer and, you know, I just kind of wanted that speed, thrash kind of sound made sense, you know, that heavy guitar sound. I wasn't into theory or I wasn't learning, learning the guitar like yeah. seriously. I just kind of like, it was a cool thing. I I picked up a few chords. I never thought I'd be a serious guitar player or that serious into guitar or join a band or anything. Right. But uh, when I heard that Metallica album, it was like, whoa, man, what is that sound? What are these riffs? What is happening? You so, know, and I think that's what set me on a trail of, I would say, like curiosity and do you, learn, was, uh, do you learn anything from that album? Like right then? Uh, not really, man. I, I I knew that that's the world I wanted to be a part of. Right. Like that's, it set me for that. Right. And um, I, I learned the songs like maybe a decade later, you know, but at, at that point it was very too overwhelming or it was too powerful or it was too crazy or right, yeah. something. I think that I could learn that stuff, you know. So, I mean, what I'd managed to learn at that point on the guitar was stuff like Roadhouse Blues and uh, yeah. some, of, some of the intros for Guns N' Roses and mm. Poison kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, but uh, yeah, Metallica was like, oh shit, this is like, it's it's crazy. And and then I started listening to a lot of metal, uh, a lot yeah. of bands. Like that. There was there was uh, one riff on that album, which was like kind of, you could play it when you just started playing. There was one called Seek and Destroy, you know, <laughs> that one. And a bit of uh, Four Horsemen. I, I learned both those uh, two songs, a little bit of those. <laughs> oh. But the, the, the next album was like, you know, the Ride the Lightning album. That That's still my favorite Metallica album. Yeah, man, that killed it. I mean, they just kept getting better from, and, yeah, yeah. from that point on. So this would have been um, late eighties again that you you got into the, all this kind of stuff. How are you getting? Yeah, how yeah. are you getting your music? Where was it coming from? Did someone uh, give it to you, or did you meet a friend or something like that? Yeah, it was my football friends. Yeah, oh, I mean okay. the one I got the Metallica uh, album from was a friend called Danny. Yeah, okay. Play football. Uh, but yeah, it was it was usually through friends. I think. Uh, because before that, most of the music I heard was dad's music at home. Um, what kind of stuff was that? Your dad's stuff, what was he listening to? Um, 
it was a lot of Bob Marley. There was Pink Floyd. Uh, there was Beatles, of course. There was, uh, you know, a lot of the music that was rock and roll slash pop for him in his time. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's he was quite a cool cat. So he would he would bring it on and. A lot of the music that made sense to me later that I would listen to growing up was a lot of like the shadows and ventures and stuff like that. Right. Like instrumental music, the idea of instrumental music was kind of like it was around the house. Yeah. Uh, and I always dug that kind of sound. I didn't know what it was, but it's funny you said that because uh, Mahesh Tanaykar he he said exactly the same thing. Like what got him into like you know guitar was uh, the shadows and ventures, like simple instrumental well, that- music. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty cool. yeah, yeah, so that was around that was that was around the house, and then my dad would also get like up. To, he'd get like the top forty music uh, recorded from CDs onto cassettes, and I think in there somewhere that be the odd, you know, like after Michael Jackson, Bon Jovi, right, or White Snake, like the pop side of White Snake, and that's what got me into that side of the music. It was yeah. like wow, more guitar driven and guitar. Yeah. Driven pop rock, accessible, kind of accessible music. Yeah, it was what I what was around the house and yeah. what what I started. What it was what I started digging. Yeah. You know, as as like uh, say now you could say guitar music. Okay, so um, who who was the first guitar player you saw live that made you go, wow, that that's pretty cool. I think that would have to be Steve Moss at the Deep Purple concert. Okay, that was ninety five uh, or ninety ninety five around then. It was not too uh, far apart from the Bon Jovi one. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was like a year after the year, after each other, I think. Uh, but yeah, that Deep Purple gig blew me away, man. Uh, just maybe that was the first big rock gig I saw. Also, like guys mm-hmm. that I grew up listening to. Um, Ian Pace was everything that he was, the legend that he was, and then um, yeah, the whole band. And then Steve Moss, I think, was the new guy. Comparatively, yeah. yeah, he had Dixie Dregs and all of that stuff that I used to listen to by then. At that yeah. point, it was, I think it was Steve Moss then. Yeah, I, I would have to say Steve Moss. And and any local uh, Indian guitarists that made you go like wow at the time you started playing? Uh, man, there was Sidhu, Siddharth Atsrekar, mm-hmm. uh, Dhruv Ganekar. They were slightly were older than you, right? Like a few years older than you. Yeah, a couple of years older. Yeah, like uh, Siddharth and we were in the same college. Okay. Uh, he was like a year senior. So Siddharth went on to uh, form Colorblind with Ram Sampath. And Dhruv, I think he had a band called Chuck Review, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Right. yeah. With two and Anand. And then later Paresh, Suraj, Naresh. Uh, yeah, and then of course Tinaikar uh, and Jayesh. From Indiscreet. I Ashful, yeah. I mean, um, uh, I, I heard, I'd heard of D Wood, you know, jazz fusion guy. Like, he was awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was Roy Venkatraman, of course. Yeah, Roy's awesome, man. Yeah. Fucking dude, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, these were the guys that kind of like, actually were the first guys I, for real, started looking up to, you know, because they were they were from our scene or from the land and yeah. everything else was foreign. So I think when you saw the guys here do it, you were yeah. like, man, I think even more inspired than... Yeah. Anything that I heard on cassette or anything. So seeing these guys live was fucking amazing, man. At like Rang Bhavan and shit. It was like, wow. Pretty much. These it's like one of us can do this, then yeah, even I can do that. <laughs> for my rock stars. And yeah, of course, Coco from Agni. Um, yeah. Always like, you know, belting out that heavy shit. It was nice, man. It was good. Yeah. It was a good time. Uh, when was your first gig? Uh, 94 with Pentagram. 94... Uh, at the Raz. Your your first gig was Pentagram at the Raz. That's that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, ninety three or ninety four. Yeah, um, and yeah, that was wicked, man. It was uh, Vishal playing bass and singing. I think that was the first and the last gig. <laughs> oh, so this was before Purple joined. Yeah, I think Purple joined the next gig on. Okay, so just like this. just backtrack. Then how did how did you meet Vishal? Uh, I was really funny, man. Uh, uh, then guitar player Clyde uh, gave me a call saying he got my number from Floyd, who's another crazy guitar player. And uh, he, Floyd got my number from Siddharth Atsrekar, who I was in college with, who told Floyd, like, hey, this is this guy, he's a new kid, like, check him out, he plays some cool guitar players. Cool, yeah. Pentagram were then looking for a guitar player. So, um, 
Uh, Clyde's like, you want to meet up? Uh, we rehearse in Pedder Road. That's Vishal's house, the guy that sings. Um, I was like, yeah, cool. Give me a date. So I think we fixed a date. And on that day, uh, I went to art school, JJ School of Art. And everything was in town back then. Um, this meeting that I had with this organizer, then organizer Jai Day, uh, who, who did a couple of rock concerts at Rang Bhavan, uh, he wanted me to design a, mu uh, a, a poster, like a poster for one of his upcoming gigs at the Riles. Mm -hmm. So I was happy with that design. And I was walking over to his place, enter the lift, and this other dude walks in the lift, big side locks jeans tucked into his boots and stuff He's like what <laughs> floor are you going to it's like yeah fourth floor and uh we ended up both walking into jai day's house and jai's like hey man meet vishal hey vishal meet randolph mm -hmm. you know it's like fuck you the same guy that's coming over to mine to audition later and i was like yeah you that same vishal singer and stuff so that's literally we met <laughs> we were to meet that same day but we met a couple hours later awesome uh, so that's how i met him and then we drove back together to his place and then uh, there was what you call an audition, um, which is cool. So Flying Colors, here we are many years later. You, you had some decent gear for that uh, first gig or were you playing some garbage? <laughs> I, had, I, had, I had a metal zone. <laughs> <laughs> which you still have, I presume. <laughs> hey, I mean, that's, that's not going anywhere, man. That's the collectors. That's yeah. the... I I mean, if it was light enough, I would have made a fucking, you know, <laughs> pendant out of it. But uh, yeah, that's that's a prized possession. That'll always be there. And I think at that point, that was the one pedal that was pretty pretty diverse with like getting a heavy sound, yeah. um, a decent rock and roll sound. I mean, if you turn it down, yeah. uh, especially if you didn't have a good amp, you know, uh, it compensated for not having a good amp. Right. Uh, and I think uh, we had decent amps back then. At least I had, a, I think we've all had a Stranger at stranger, some point. Yeah. I mean, I've seen uh, you playing that uh, Metal Zone into the Stranger at like some pro gigs later down the line and you still sounded great, you know, with that. Yeah, it was a nice combo. It worked, yeah. it worked fairly well. And of course, thanks to the engineers at that point. I mean, there was Shantanu Hudlikar yeah. to save us from sounding bad. <laughs> yeah, that was decent. So the the uh, first uh, the first gig at Raz, I'm assuming it it went off pretty well. Yeah, it was good, man. I mean, we 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 could rock some of those covers pretty damn well. Yeah, and kind of also was at that stage where we started writing some original material. Did you play any original stuff at that first gig? I did play the originals that those three, like Vishal, Clyde, and Shiraz, wrote. Mm -hmm. and I had to learn them to play that gig so yeah we did play pentagram originals but it was nothing that i'd written with the band right it was a song called uh <laughs> a song called satan i mean how can you not forget that <laughs> and did the two others i have forgotten what they were called but <laughs> satan satan and two other songs i remember that i had to learn yeah so we did do some original and were, were you all called pentagram at that first gig as well oh yeah so you already yeah, yeah, had yeah. the name and everything okay Cool. Yeah. And uh, how long did it take? How many gigs did it take before you, you the band started sounding like, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy with the way things are going and everything? I think what was awesome was that we just connected as friends and just as musicians at that point that weren't really connected to a music scene. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like on the fringe of like these wild guys who just want to make some wild music. We all knew we wanted to make new music. So I think that was what really brought us together. It was like, yeah, let's experiment with now and the future. And for that, I think we all kind of also had that dedication, knowing that we'd have to work really, really hard. Right. Yeah. So we did, man. Uh, we actually did. We actually rehearsed, like, I think for two years, like, nonstop. Like, I would I come from... You you're a prolific rehearsers. I mean, we, I, sometimes as to pass that road, I could hear your uh, practice from, like, down on the street. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was fun, man. It wasn't. It wasn't like work or anything. We really, really enjoyed playing and yeah. wanting to find this new sound. And so I would come from Andheri. I would. I would go to college, which was in VT, and from VT take a bus to Pedder Road, finish rehearsals, and then come back home and do that every day the whole year. You know, for like two years. I think practice gets you better, if not perfect. 
So I, I guess the, the, at that time, like every band to make a name for itself would take part in these uh, college competitions, you know, IIT and RAIT and the like. So which, yeah. was, which was the first uh, competition that you guys won? The first competition we won was uh, IIT Kanpur. Achha. So you all traveled uh, on the train, I'm guessing. Yes, unreserved compartment. <laughs> uh, to Kanpur. That must have been what, like a, a long journey, yeah? Bombay to Kanpur. Longer than Delhi, for sure. Man, it was like a Wes Anderson movie, dude. It was like, <laughs> it had to be made into a film that was that film, you know? I mean, a rock band's journey. I think at that point, pretty much took all our gear with us. So it was, it was quite a trip. It was quite a trip. And, um, and also, I guess that, that combined suffering brings the band together. <laughs> yeah, I mean... <laughs> It's like now that we're going to Kanpur like this, we better fucking win, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, those were crazy, man. There was like 150 bands before that, just like eliminations for like three days. It was crazy, man. Good times. <laughs> do, you, do you remember any uh, bands that you became friends with on that particular uh, festival? I mean, there was Orange Street. Hmm. I met Khan and... So you met them right away at that? We met them right. Yeah, yeah. Samrat was playing drums then, and Neil bass. And Saibal, Saibal, Saibal uh, then. Uh, So meeting Saibal was a trip because I mean that was the first time we met him, and we'd only hear stories of him from Bombay. It was like, yeah. man, there's this dude from Delhi. He's a demon. He's fucking. He's like one of the most intimidating guys to watch on guitar. You, know? you see him playing, you don't want to play for a while. <laughs> yeah, and he was, and he was, man. He was damn intimidating, and just his personality also. You know, he's like, who the fuck are you guys? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> And uh, it was fun. It was fun. Eventually, caught up. And then um, right after Kanpur, those guys, in fact, Orange Street were like, why aren't you guys just come straight off to Delhi? Delhi's happening next week. Mm -hmm. uh, some of you guys can crash with us. It was really sweet of them, actually. And that's how we ended up going to Delhi. And then we won Delhi IIT straight after that. Okay, so straight from Kanpur, you all traveled to Delhi. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, sure. yeah, I think Vishal might have had some work back at home. Uh, he always has work. <laughs> Them came back and then a couple of couple of us went straight to Delhi. So you you won two competitions like back to back in the span of like two weeks or something. Yeah, that was a trip. Yeah, we would have had gone through like some three hundred bands, not just like okay coming out of that, but I mean watching all of them was a trip. I think just the joy of like wow you're not alone. Like look at the amount of bands you have in this country and like yeah. that, there's that many bands. Uh, that are actually pretty good and that's what made me want to travel more within the country to understand what and where the sound was coming from. But then you think back in the day you thought only okay Bombay, Delhi, yeah. Pune, Bangalore had this kind of cool sound or a vibe but I think there were so many other smaller cities uh, like Lucknow. There mm -hmm. were some killer bands from Lucknow man. And of course the Northeast, North like East, banging, yeah. banging bands in the yeah. Northeast. <laughs> like they, they would humble you. I mean some guitar players from the Northeast fuck. Uh, so that was a trip, man. We just sit down like all night, watch all the 70, 80 bands. It's a uh, good uh, community sense also. You meet like all the you know, other bands and everything. I remember like all the IITs, every time we met like bands from out, outside our city, it was like, you know, you yeah. networked and you made friends and, you know, some some of them I even speak to today. Just all those relationships formed at, at those festivals. So at, at the time, uh, yeah. when, you're, when you're winning these competitions, uh, how, how much of your set was original music or was it still relying on the covers? Oh yeah, we were trying to push actually for more more originals and less covers. Mm -hmm. uh, we had three covers that we knew would win us mm -hmm. through any... Uh, what were those? <laughs> Uh, Hotel California, there was this Queen medley. We did a Pearl Jam tune. I think it was uh, Alive. We had backup. We had like, I think we did Sad But True by Metallica. And then there was Green Day, Basket Case. So that was like a perfect college winner set. Yeah. But we decided consciously that, dude, we need to fucking play some originals. Because, I mean, kind of Bombay represent. And, you know, Bombay is that hip city. And yeah. like, yeah, man, dude, check this out. So we had like four originals of, at that point. Four, three or four originals. Uh, one was a song called Now, and the other one was called Mother, and there was a song called uh, Ig Ig The Ignorant One. So all those songs uh, yeah. ended up going on your uh, first album, which was called We Are Not Listening, yeah. I believe? Yes. Okay. So didn't that album deal come about as a result of one of these competitions or something like that? Yeah, so uh, that's the thing. So we actually made a hat trick, man. After we after Delhi, then was the Bombay IIT. Yeah. And then we came back and we won the Bombay IIT. And then if you won the Bombay IIT, you had 
that particular year, the band that won got a record deal through Plus Music or something. Suddenly we were in the studio and then we had, a, we had to make a music video and then that music video was on MTV and then like, oh shit, this band is really blown up kind of vibe happened. <laughs> but it was, yeah, it was from those, from those originals. I think Ignorant One was the first single that we put out. Right. I mean, thank you, IIT, for your love and support. <laughs> I think, I mean, it, 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 that's pretty banging, man. I think... Like other than Rang Bhavan and like we had our clubs, we had the Raz and stuff like yeah. that. But back in the day, I mean, everyone looked forward to going to an IIT. Yeah, that, that was like the biggest gig in the city apart from Independence Rock. It was just two two gigs a year that you kind of look forward to you know, in terms of like 5,000 or more people at the gig. Yeah, my, my favorite thing was the, the fact that it went on past midnight, yeah. you know, and it would go on till early morning. That was great. Those elements were more like, fun than the finals, I think, you know. There's always a lot of interesting things happening during those elements. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent, man, hundred percent. I mean, again, like you were saying, uh, bands meeting other bands, guitar players meeting other guitar players, yeah. and like there's so much to exchange and discuss and talk about. Yeah, um, it, that was awesome, man. Fab. It was like a big, big. Yeah, before festivals and everything, that was that was the best. And it was usually just before the New Year. I remember that. So it was like I think between Christmas and New Year, you know. It was, it was, it was like the a, perfect week, man. Yeah, yeah. The, the best week if you're in the rock the, music. The weather was good and everything. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, uh, they uh, don't hold rock gigs at that amphitheater anymore, which I think is kind of sad, considering the amount of sure history that uh, venue has. Now yeah. They've, they've moved it into some open field so they can fit more people, but you've kind of lost like a, a big sense of the... At least I feel I, that way. I know. I think the last gig that I went back to check out was uh, a Trillo Gurtu gig. Yeah, I remember and that. Because I was playing with Karsh just before that gig. Oh, nice. So I got to, nice. to watch that as well. That was a cool one. Uh, so now just talk a little bit about that first uh, album recording. Any cool stories you've got to share? I remember that, that song Mother had a really nice, you know, clean guitar part. But uh, apart from any other uh, songs that that you still like from that album? Oh man, that's crazy because I mean, it just just hit me for a second that we actually used to play the whole song through, you know what I mean? Like, I don't think I've spent too many hours recording that much. We just spent hours in that studio, man. We were there nights and days, like nonstop. Uh, I think it was a thrill and joy also of being in a studio. Yeah, for the first time. With. What was the name of Kept the studio up. you recorded in? Uh, it was Prakash Shetty Studio. Uh, I don't remember exactly what he called it Where back was it? then. It was right opposite the Stock Exchange building Okay. in town. Uh, Shri, the bass player, uh, happened to be a very good friend of his. Mm-hmm. And uh, Shri was part of a very cool band also at that point with Derek Julian. Okay. But they played a few They played a few gigs uh, at Rang Bhavan, uh, at some of the jazz yatras that go check out. And stuff. Okay. So she was like a guy, like he was like, whoa, this guy's coming to help us. <laughs> it was a joy, man. She came in and helped us with some of the sounds and just production and stuff. Okay. That we had no idea um, what we were doing back then. But yeah, to, to learn about mixing and like what stuff is going into what and what's what it's being recorded on. Because I think we recorded on the tape at that point. Yeah. Never after that have I ever recorded on tape. I think the... the <laughs> The digital uh, scene just went crazy. Do you remember how many tracks you had when you were recording on tape? Was it 8, 16, 24? I think it was 16. Okay. I think it was 16. Okay. I think we had that mapped out into our head that it was going to be bass, drum, guitar, vocals. Yeah. Because you, need, you need to make some very quick and decisions which stay throughout the album, you know, when you, it, when you record. The limitations are like also what kind of focuses you to say, okay, this is what we need to do, you know, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, and and I think even if you were an engineer back then, like editing used to be a bitch, yeah, man. It wasn't as easy as it was. And the thing is also like when, when you uh, play together as a, a lineup, you got to listen to what each one is doing just to make it go down on tape properly. You know what I mean? Yeah. You have to fall into a groove where you can't chip and chop and edit shit. So you have to have that down before you even, you know, press record. Yeah, yeah absolutely, man. Listen. And uh, yeah, just learning all your mic positioning and yeah. what mics work better than some and and you know getting used to the difference between how you sounded in your jam room to actually how you're going to sound on the speakers and trying to trying to make those adjustments and were you all in a very big room or like were you all crammed in close together it was i think two at a time it was it was it was a small studio and i think it was yeah it was it was cool man it was cool i think it was just like 
learning for the first time how big your guitars can sound if you know you double track double them double track and, and spread them out here yeah. <laughs> those kind of things those those basics went a long way man it was yeah. like wow in a studio amazing so uh yeah bless uh, mr shetty and sri out with that process but the band had a lot of fun i think the release was on cassette if i'm not mistaken yeah it was on cassette man yeah i remember sid had the cassette so i borrowed it from him and i listened to it quite a few times so when you when you finally um, heard like the cassette in your car or something like that did you feel like a sense of accomplishment like you know this is our album and we've done something and i mean if i have to be honest by the time we finished it i was like man this could sound better you know let's write another album yeah looking forward uh, to the next one already looking forward to the next one uh, but it was cool i mean it it always meant something when somebody else heard it yeah with a car and said hey man that sounds good mm. it, it kind of knew you on the right path or you're doing something right what what did the family think about it when when that album came out did they listen to it i think they were thrilled man it's like wow this guy actually put something out on tape <laughs> after just sitting in his bedroom for like so many years practicing yeah. probably um, lost his friends and like i mean <laughs> talking to him what's wrong with this guy yeah. all he does is play guitar so seeing that must have meant something like i think it just kind of like okay this guy is really wants to do this like this is his scene you know because i mean yeah for them i don't think any of them understood what it was like to be an indian playing some very out there music you know <laughs> yeah. like, this yeah. is not your culture this is not your scene I mean, how can not, we do it it's not like you were playing dire straits or something which was you know a little bit more <laughs> it was like actual well, yeah it was it was some us so that was sweet it was sweet that it got accepted it was sweet i think i think the fact that there was that one mtv video also kind of even if people didn't want to say sweet they had to be chuck because now you're on mtv okay yeah correct so how long between that and then the next album did that take some time because i think the the, the second album when it came out was like a a left turn because the first one still kind of had some roots in more conventional rock styles the second one i think you know, had the the groove box and then the electronica crept in in a big way so we are not listening was 96 mm-hmm. i think we we started touring a lot like a hell of a lot like yeah. 96 97 98 like we started playing many other cities so a lot of them were big gigs like i mean in bombay rangwan was the only spot that you had and raz but then that was like once a year or something iit was once a year but uh, bangalore was pretty lively pune was pretty lively delhi was pretty lively um calcutta So we were playing all these other cities in rotation which is pretty awesome you know around that point I think I had done enough of practicing and playing at that point to get to where I wanted to be and then it was like what next for me at least so uh, there was a lot of the breaks that I would take uh, spend a lot of time with my DJ friends you know back then we would be playing in a lot of the clubs mm-hmm. uh, out and then also taking breaks and go and stuff and like going to a lot of raves uh, listening to a lot of electronic music that was part of a culture forming on by itself yeah it it became uh, a thriving culture in goa especially right around that time yeah it was great late 90s in goa was fab so it was it was part of this new culture it was great and i started to see that as like a new rock and roll you know i mean mm. in in a sense of like okay where and what next i think bands back then were either going back to a more classic sound or kind of trying to call themselves like new metal and stuff there were a few good bands like i i really really like system of a down yeah. i really like corn but there was nothing beyond that it was there was no new story being told yeah it became a clone of itself i guess a lot of those yeah. bands are sounding the same Yeah yeah exactly. So I think electronic music for me started becoming the new sound of rock music as as I was imagining in my head. And then I just brought that sound to the band. I I would make them listen to bands like The Prodigy and mm. The Chemical Brothers. Uh there was massive attack and stuff like that happening you at that point. You always throw in some of those samples I guess in your live set. I remember because all those three bands you've kind of had a little bit of those songs, you know. Prodigy, yeah. Chemical Brothers, and Massive Attack. You used to have yeah. this one Massive Attack loop. I think that used to uh, play over one. Yeah. So I don't remember the name of the song, but yeah, I kind of remember all those three uh, featuring in your set. Yeah, that was the Massive Attack loop was from a track called Angel. Okay. Um, and I think we used to mash it up with one of our own songs. Yeah. Um, 
and the prodigy was we'd mash up uh, smack my bitch up with seal because um, i remember that that actually became a, a a feature of your set where you would have like some of your own stuff mashed up with the, you wouldn't like play a cover you wouldn't play the original i mean the lines are getting blurred between that right yeah it was it was the pentagram thing man it was like whatever we do on stage let's try and keep it fresh or sounding original and mm-hmm. not like we're doing a cover but let it be a version let it be a an interpretation of what that artist left for us to kind of like take forward how did the audiences that, take it when that switch happened uh some took it well some didn't i guess that's what anything new yeah. you know for people to kind of take their time to adjust you know i mean it takes it takes a while to bridge that gap and connect but uh i think the only way to do it is to keep doing it i guess or kind of adjust it in your set in different ways where it's not too far left like you were saying it's not too far out of reach and we found that we found that balance which is good man i think it, it helped that vishal and shiraz and clyde and papal all had equal and individual inputs uh within the band and then we always used that summation out uh when we were playing live right and it fit naturally man it was it was a natural progression i think a couple of years later dance music did creep into our culture and it did become something electronic music did become something and people finally started to relate to it as a new sound yeah. so then we had a new generation that didn't really care if you were a, like a rock band or a metal band yeah. or we just playing music yeah it's just music so thank god for that you know i mean that opened up i think a lot of possibilities for a lot of us to branch out into a lot of various forms and styles and dynamics within music as opposed to just sticking with like a heavy template or like a i don't know just two or three templates that were around back in the day so uh yeah and then that that kept us fresh i think that was our reward uh, for working hard and staying true or or trying to work this new sound out uh and that kept us going and uh, the second album where did you all record that <laughs> that was a u turn man that was like uh, mostly done on this little 808 sampler uh, it was a roland sp808 sampler on a 100 mb zip disk i i didn't even have a computer at that point clyde had a computer so i'd be working on all these beats sampling resampling and there were only four tracks on that machine right and I kind of I didn't know if you could use the word cheat but you can use the word cheat because I kind of like I got Vishal and to record vocals and saying that you know I mean let's put down some vocals on this so I can arrange and edit and stuff like that make the song and then we can record it in a studio right I ended up just using those as the final takes uh which kind of like obviously had that raw energy it was fresh uh plus I think recording it onto a sampler you know uh kind of gave it its own texture and its own vibe around uh, th- around that time didn't vishal have his own studio as well he did have his own studio that was all the way in in uh, mahalakshmi yeah the, the graveyard studio tino studio in <laughs> in mahalakshmi yeah that was i mean he would work i think that's when him and shaker also started working on yeah. his stuff and that's when they started uh, making a lot of like the hits any of the pentagram stuff recorded at uh, vishal's place or was it still on that machine He'd- we we rehearsed there a lot oh, we okay. rehearsed in that studio a lot uh it was a nice quiet studio to rehearse any time of the night which was yeah. awesome because there was nothing f- close by you know residential now there is but that time there wasn't yeah that cemetery added a nice touch <laughs> out there for that there was a massive cemetery outside so this the second album uh you you mixed it on that same machine itself or you they took it to a studio and did some work on it it's place and I think he was running a version of Nuendo mm. uh back then and we tracked these four tracks out bounced them uh it was kind of like a hack it was like okay how do we do something that you would do in a studio on on a machine that's in your fucking bedroom yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever read the and manual of that machine I I yeah I I was a cat at this machine man anything like I I had the MC303 before this the groove box okay. so I loved these little groove boxes you know and i would follow the manual and i would work these things out like that because it was a thrill it was a trip what are these new sounds what yeah. this is amazing i was barely playing any guitar but i was like twiddling all these knobs and stuff but it was great it was a great experiment uh to 
kind of fused those ideas. Like I started writing riffs on them that made my guitar playing or challenged my guitar playing rather mm-hmm. uh, a lot more than what I was listening to. Uh, just sonically and in terms of arrangement, in terms of like, it got me better with playing with a band. You know, it's kind of know your part, you know, your, your structure and stuff like that. So that actually got me also into arranging and stuff. Somehow it sounded decent to the rest of the guys in the band and they were like, fuck this. Sounds different, sounds weird, sounds crazy, but let's put it out. And I think Sony picked it up and Sony distributed that album for us, which again gave us like some form of, okay, this is crazy, but it's official. Like Sony is putting it out. So yeah. it's like, they must be doing something right. Yeah. What is the second one called? The name up. escapes up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So then from at, at that time, I'm guessing you were probably the biggest band in the country in terms of the amount of gigs you were doing, headlining, you know, most of these college festivals. From from that point, how, how did you all keep it fresh? You all just kept on writing new stuff? and uh... Yeah, I mean, for one, we didn't rehearse. We didn't, I mean, the rehearsals, we kind of spaced it out, you know. It's okay. only if we, we needed to rehearse, we kind of rehearsed. I would be doing a lot of my writing individually, like separately. Earlier, it was kind of like getting together and, and writing parts with the band and stuff. But... I think distance and then like work getting a little more intense for everyone else. I started writing a lot at home uh, in my own space with all of this technology that was around. And I'd always put down new ideas and riff constantly. And of course, the internet was Mm -hmm. like finally getting its speed. So it was easy to like send files across to different members in the band. And they could kind of like write at their own leisure whenever they had. And this was slightly before I think phones even came in as being little computers. Yeah. So that was like phase two of like the way we started writing stuff. And uh, like, again, Vishal wrote voice like that. He wrote voice and then sent me like a recording on the phone. Be like, yeah, I want to work on this. That's still, I think, one of your most accessible songs. Probably one of my favorites. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. You know, uh, the guitar, all the guitar on that song was recorded on a GBNH guitar. Yeah, or some acoustic guitar or something. I remember you tell, told me. It's GBNH acoustic guitar, and I went in directly through a sound card. There was no amp, there was no uh, pedals. I had this dirty DS1 distortion simulation plug-in <laughs> that I got that little overdrive and distortion for. It was, it's, it's lo-fi as hell in terms of a signal chain, but it sounds great, you know, and it fits the, the song perfectly. I mean, of course, the, the playing is also, you know, what what matters the most. It's a really cool solo. Once you get into those, uh, you know, those um, ascending <laughs> things, that's, that's, that's cool, man. It's like rock and roll. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> I mean. uh, when did uh, Shy and Funk happen? Around the same time as the third album or a little bit after that? That was Shy and Funk, I think, started around 2006. Okay. It was just after we put out the third album. So I think the third album was 2005. Um, and I met Monica 2006 and then 2006 and we started playing our first few gigs and then again that that became a really popular successful um, act and we started playing and touring all over I was going to ask because at one point like both China and Funk and Pentagram were touring extensively so how did you manage to keep a, a balance between the two I mean that was easy man it's like you know that this is where you're headed, right? This is You know that this is the life you want to live. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that part of it, like waking up early, catching those early morning yeah. flights and all was okay, something that you you expect. But uh, I think the good thing was that I would write or ended up writing a lot of the music. Mm-hmm. It, there was nothing that I had to learn uh, or that music was it's already here. And I think, yeah, I think the thing was finding time for rehearsal. That was, that was the trickiest bit. Mm. Right. You know, because playing gigs and stuff was, I think, more management. I mean, they would sort out the dates yeah. and Make all of sure that was, stuff. There was no clash in all between the two. I think rehearsals would clash a lot of times because I think both bands were pushing for a lot of new ideas, a lot of new stuff, a lot of improv. Uh, we never liked doing the same set as a set twice unless we really had to. Yeah. 
um, shift around arrangements. So I think we just collectively as a group of musicians, we knew that we had to work hard and find a way out, figure a way out. You know? So there was always a way out. It wasn't really hard and difficult. And then it, you get used to it. It was fine. How different was, was uh, the uh, writing process, working with Vishal and then working with Monica? A lot of difference in the process? I mean, I would leave it up to them. Really, like, uh, I would be uh, based on the lyric or the idea okay. of how how they would want to sing the song. And then I would take that emotion and then translate it sonically. So uh, sometimes, I mean, a lyric would mean that you really want to belt it out and really want to scream it out or... Mm-hmm. You want to chill it out or you want to cascade it out. Uh, yeah, so there's, there's many different things that I took from both of their emotion, both of their lyrical skills, uh, and of course, their their idea of arrangements and how they choose to harmonize and make these melodies. Right. And then I would just like, and I would try to compliment them. And other times it would just be me giving them a beat, you know, like this is what I feel like is say uh, a beat that would destroy 10,000 people in a stadium, right. you know, check beat out. Yeah. And then we'd get ready for that kind of in our headspace. So you, like, okay, cool. you were writing with the live show in mind. Oh yeah, always, man. I think it's still, it still is. And I, I think will always be one of the most special reasons for me getting into music. It is all about live. It is about that performance. Mm-hmm. I mean, I feel like I'm a real cat in the studio with with a few certain things but it's still a fucking room you know what i mean it's boring yeah. and uh it's not that like it's the the crowd applauding or the cheer or anything yeah. uh or being the number one band but it's about that energy exchange yeah, you know i mean that energy that you get back or you give exactly it's a cyclical process you give it and then they f- fling it back at you and then it keeps going back and forth yeah, and that that party that you create, I mean, that's that's what you want to live for. You know what I mean? I mean, those moments help a band, I feel, or help me go forward and write a new way for, come back there and like play it better. Right. I have to say though, because for the last three Black Star Blues albums, I I wrote from the point of view of the live show, but this yeah. next album, I didn't really have any preconceived notions of gigging that stuff. So it suddenly became like all the barriers were you know open again. So it's yeah. cool to just go through the, to that once, you know. Cycles, man. Yeah, you yeah. go in and out of these cycles. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, okay, so uh, once uh, both Pentagram and, and Shire and Funk uh, started, you know, touring extensively, you still found time to do a couple of solo albums, I believe. I remember you, you had one called Mushroom Marathas. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I have, I have, I've just put out 10 uh, releases, man. My new project, Blitch. It's like techno, electronic, house music, that side of the adventure for me, you know, I mean, it's like a lot of the, the sound that I'm into. But uh, yeah, I'm always writing, man. I'm always, that's my palette. I wake up the last five years, I wake up at 5.36 in the morning by default. Okay. And I'm constantly checking out new plugins uh, and then I'll write a beat, a couple of beats every morning with my chai. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm always putting stuff down, putting them into folders, arranging them. So then I always listen to them at different points. But uh, that's something I do, man, uh, a lot just by default. It's an experimental, maybe a phase that I'm going through right now. And it's it's been around for a while, but I don't think it's going anywhere. I just can't stop, man. <laughs> that's the, you're the one of the most prolific people I know because it just keeps flowing out of you. And it, it never really stops, you know. Um, is there anything you, you you still think you haven't touched upon any genre that you would still like to re- to visit at some point that you haven't already done? I, I don't know about genres, but I mean, I, I feel as a sound, I mean, maybe at some point, uh, like playing a, a Spanish guitar, like getting into that kind was, of sound. I was like going to ask, like, would you ever do like an unplugged album or something like that? <laughs> yeah, I really like that sound, man. I really like how you can just with that one instrument, like spell out so many colors or whatever. Mm-hmm. Just as a minimal, I like minimal ideas, you know, like restrict yourself and create maximum music. So I think that's like, that's, that's a challenge for me. Um, I also like to, and I never played the piano. So like maybe get into some piano playing. Uh, yeah, maybe like conduct an orchestra or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Do, do some of that kind of stuff. <laughs> I, don't know. I mean, I'll have to hire someone to write and all that stuff. Yeah. But just to kind of be able to 
to create something on that scale, yeah, which I've al- never done. You can always hire an arranger because those are uh, the guys who take your composition and then write it for the orchestra, you know. So that's what I meant, yeah, the, <laughs> yeah. the arranger. Uh, is there any collaboration that uh, you would, uh, you know, like a dream collaboration, what, what would that be like? Oh, Ooh. shit. Man, Prince just died, dude. Uh, <laughs> David Bowie. Um, it's cool. I mean, you can you can you can pick dead people also. It's fine. Yeah, but I, I mean, we should really do something, dude. Like, uh, yeah, we've been talking about it for the better part of a few years. <laughs> we will, I guess, at some point. I, I don't get a name for it. Also. It, it, I think I just call it war. It was like putting down a folder that I had to send you. And I think I started <laughs> writing war and then I just stopped that war and then I just kept it war. That'd be Excuse amazing. me, sorry. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, man. I'm, uh, I'd be keen for that. Um, any uh, any bits of music that used to give you goosebumps when you were a kid and, and still do the same for you these days? And not just for nostalgia reasons. It's like it always gives you goosebumps. Any anything like that, you? you yeah, I mean, like the Nam Pink Floyd. Uh, I listen to something by The Cure, Lullaby. I mean, anything from the Mezzanine album by Massive Attack. Yeah, it's a good one. But even some old stuff. I mean, even before I was into music, maybe. I mean, when I hear some of it now, like some some of the old Elvis stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't know how how he used to sing that. Um, uh, you were a pretty big Pantera fan, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, now we're talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, man. I, I, uh, I would still say like two of my top most guitar players would be uh, Dimebag and Nuno Bencourt. Like just the time that I was into them, like I think, and the chops I've learned or feel that I got out of them or wanted to play. I think will stay with me forever. Uh, but Dimebag was amazing, man. He was like a flawless guitar player, like crazy energy. I mean, he was like a demon on stage. Uh, and that that level of fire, I kind of have yet to see maybe, I think. Or like probably there's been, there's been and there will be and there are so many undiscovered. But Very, uh, just think, very distinctive tone as well he had. The sound was like very, very unique. Very, very interesting, man. But I... I think more more importantly, I I dug the riffs. <clears throat> Maybe that had something to do with his brother. Yeah, and jamming together. But the riffs that they made, um, especially around the halftime, the the breakdowns, and I think that band invented the word drop. I mean, the the, the drops dropped <laughs> by Pantera were fucking drops, man. Yeah. Um, and there was there was still that southern soul and blues and swing and everything in the in the playing as well. You could tell that they had listened to that. You know? Yeah, yeah, I mean, and and they're they're also for me like a total left turn band, you know. I mean, they were hair metal bands. Yeah, I, I don't know if you're aware, but they had like yeah, a few hair metal. He was, he was and Diamond like, Daryl, and then he became Dimebag. <laughs> yeah, so that switch they made, and then came out with Cowboys from Hell. That was that was what blew my mind the most. You know, it's like wow, what an album, man. Yeah, and uh, Rage Against the Machine, I think, was a, a pretty big influence when it came out. Yeah, again, it was the riffs. I think it was, I, I, I think I was always, um, I, maybe it was the time and the music that I was listening to also was to kind of deliberately get away from the soloist angle. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially in my scene, there was like so many guys just like putting that at the forefront of music. One thing I learned from you is how you always manage to play like right either on the beat or slightly behind it. You, you would never rush your riffs. And as a result, it kind of gave them a lot more gravity, I think. You know, when you heard those, especially in like a big venue, like in a stadium or something, hearing those riffs. And I was, I was always trying to figure like, what, what the hell is it about like when he plays that sounds different to when other people, you know, like people who haven't been playing for a very long time, for example. There's, a, there's something about it. And then later on it struck me, dude, it's like the timing, the way he plays it. And that, that was like a big light bulb moment for me. I was like, oh, you gotta like, you know, don't don't blow your load right away. You just like, you know what I mean? Just like sit on the groove. Without, yeah, but I think I have rushing. to be honest, man. I think that might have been the weed I was smoking. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> whatever Feedback it takes to do the job. Whatever it takes to do the job. It's all good. <laughs> uh, but really, yeah, I mean, I seriously, I like, I like that sludginess. I think uh, 
like Kim Tyre from Soundgarden was mm. a lot of, a lot of the, a lot of the early 90 guitar players kind of played in that manner i think of i don't know whether it was deliberately trying to break that mold of tightness and a finesse sound and deliberately sound raw or it was just like a bunch of friends hanging at an after party you know a couple of drinks down and you're just kind of like loosely jamming but creating a really really warm vibe yeah. so i think for me playing slightly behind created that warm vibe i mean that mm-hmm. and that's that warmth is what i was after all the time so it's like i'm not going to change what i'm doing or trying to do or i don't know what's happening but this is this feels right and i just stuck with it you know and and of course yeah i mean so coming back to rage uh rage brought that out again like listening to them felt fresh to me because they were playing it so groovy and so funky and it wasn't it wasn't bang on tight it was like the chili peppers you know it was like yeah. prashanthe playing those riffs it was just just right i think he smoked the same weed also <laughs> awesome uh normally i ask you know people who are interviewing like how how much of an in, uh, impact do you think the the gear itself makes on your tone but i've seen you get like a great sound out of like some you know random gear and it always sounds like you so i'm not even going to like you know get into that i know the answer already <laughs> i think honestly man one that was there was an art school thing you know i think in art school one of the things i learned and will always take that with me was to create something with what you have you yeah. know and uh to make something even out of nothing if you had but it doesn't mean that you have to settle for it like in the sense i'd never be like oh i have only this much so i'm only going to play so much i'm like no motherfucker i have this much but i'm going to destroy that fucking stadium yeah i i still like my sound check times like i take that pretty seriously i always show up on time because i like to work the venue i like yeah. to work the amp because every everything and every time is different you know and i like to be ready for that or at least enjoy myself with the band by spending that extra sound check time and getting your sound right So obviously the sound guy is very important because mm-hmm. he's giving you your output the people that that are hearing what you're playing is because of him yeah and also uh it's the mental state that you're in man like you could be coming out from uh, a fight with your girlfriend or you fight with your family or you failed your exam or something but you still got to give it your best man and i think mentally i was always prepared for something more than how i sounded and kind of force that energy out of me right uh, when when you uh when you move the knobs to tweak your sounds and stuff are you already hearing the sound in your head and you're moving the knobs to get closer to that is that how you dial your sound in i never like setting my sound by myself for myself and i always set it with the drummer or the bass player to begin with and if that that's vibing i'm like yeah man let's stick with this and then if this is happening vishal is going to be fine or yeah monic or whoever whoever singing yeah is going to be cool. i i realized this uh, not necessarily for the same reason but i i never really play till the drummer starts playing because what happens if you start pl- playing guitar before the drums start playing the sound engineer starts coming and saying hey you're too loud you're too loud so all you have to do is yeah. just wait let the drummer start playing and normally the sound engineers they love the drums that's like their favorite thing So they are like yeah drums yeah 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 and so while the drummer is like bow 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 then you turn your amp up to where you can hear yourself and then nobody complains after that <laughs> Especially I mean, I think we've played with loud drummers man Jay and like Shiraz and these guys are loud guys and Sid man Sid was a, a loud guy Actually, Sid is yeah. damn loud <laughs> we, we did a gig together we have a little we think all laptop it is so funny The funny thing is I used to tell Sid see how shiraz plays why don't you like hit the drums like a like a real guy like shiraz so then i think that's kind of what got him on to that that's what did it man and and he used to he used to always tell me can you play more like randolph the good thing you didn't man <laughs> well i tried and i got somewhere else in the process <laughs> it's like me and that metallica album dude I would say like in in feeling to to emulate you you come up with something new. Yeah, of course man. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and uh just to uh, 
close this delightful conversation, you get to turn the tables and, and ask me a question. Yeah, I mean, if, if you better choose another instrument, okay, for that matter, and then based on that instrument, who are the other guys would you want to be members in your band, like All Star? Uh, I'll, I'll give you two answers, actually. I've always wanted to play the pedal steel. I think it's a fascinating instrument just because there's so much shit going on. Ten strings and those knee levers and the pedals and everything. So if I was playing pedal steel, then I'd probably want to have like some kind of a rootsy Americana kind of outfit. And, nice. And uh, the other one is I'd love to play drums. So, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing, man. Yeah, I always think like while playing guitar, I'm a frustrated drummer. So Me too, man. Me too. I just like ha- have a killer bass player and, you know, whatever. Just, you know. Who that, uh, who that bass player be? Bass player, someone who understands harmony. Uh, I do not so, know. Name. Come on, nothing to lose. Oh, I mean, like take some names and everything. I mean, take a yeah, superstar bass player, your ideal sure. bass player, sure, if you bring drums. I'll, I'll say Paul McCartney. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> because he can sing as well. And then, uh, <laughs> and then guitar players, you know, there's like, there's always a million guitar players who could do the job. <laughs> you know, come on, you have to pick a guitar player. Pick one guitar player. Sure, Paul McCartney and, and who complete? Nuno, Nuno Wettencourt. <laughs> oh my God, that would be sick. That would be epic, dude. <laughs> it'll be fun but the first I'll need to learn how to play drums right now I can barely play like two grooves or something <laughs> anyway thanks you so much for doing this this has been an utter pleasure and we've had uh, a long overdue catch up in the process yep, yep. so uh, thanks thanks Andrew. I'm happy keep this going man yeah man it's awesome for sure <laughs>